salvation. I've heard it many times over the years and I, it always strikes me as funny and it also always strikes me as very true and it just seemed to fit for this morning. There was a news broadcast that went out over the airwaves and it warned the people to leave the area because a mighty flood was coming. Well, there was a devout old man and he prayed to the Lord to save him as he sat in his easy chair and as he remained in his easy chair. And he waited for God to come and rescue him. Well, the waters rose and the water began to fill the house. And the man climbed to the roof and again he prayed for God to rescue him. And about that time along the flood, here came one of his good friends in a boat and says, hey man, I've come to get you and take you to dry land. And he went, no, I'm waiting here for the Lord to rescue me. And his friend went, okay, buddy. See ya, maybe. So the water continued to rise and it began to cover the roof and about the time he's on the edge of the very top on his tiptoes and the water's coming up to his knees along comes a rescue helicopter and the guys put a ladder down and they holler, grab the ladder, climb in, we'll take you to dry land. He went, no, I'm waiting on the Lord to rescue me. They went, okay. Well, the water continued to rise and the man drowned. He gets to heaven and he's mad at the Lord and he's railing at the Lord and says, Lord, why didn't you save me? And he went, uh, save you? I sent you a broadcast that said go somewhere safe. Then I sent your friend in a boat. Then I sent a helicopter. You wouldn't take any of them. I did try to rescue you. Please remain seated as I read the next adventure in the book of Joshua. Chapter 10, verse 1. That's where we'll begin today. Now next week, I'm going to jump ahead to chapter 14. I know some of you have been reading along as we've been going through Joshua. So next week you got a pretty big reading. But it's, it's reading, uh, by the way, that will help you sleep at night. If you need any help sleeping at night. It's where all the land gets distributed to whoever. Chapter 10, verse 1. At this time, Adonai, Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had defeated Ai and completely destroyed it, as he had also done to Jericho and its king. The king also learned that the Gibeonites had made a peace agreement with Israel and that they lived nearby. Adonai Zedek and his people were very afraid because of this. Gibeon was not a little town like Ai. It was a large city, as big a city that had a king and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent a message to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debar, king of Eglon, and he begged them, Come with me and help me attack Gibeon, which has made peace agreement with Joshua and the Israelites. Then these five Amorite kings, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon, gathered their armies, went to Gibeon, surrounded it, and attacked it. The Gibeonites sent this message to Joshua in his camp at Gilgal. Don't let us, your servants, be destroyed. Come quickly and help us. Save us. All the Amorite kings from the mountains have joined their armies and are fighting against us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gibeon should have been one of the Canaanites' allies. But instead, they had established a treaty with Israel. Alarmed, Adonai Zedek intensifies his efforts at building an alliance and an army with the kings of other nearby city-states. Who, by the way, had all been enemies up until this point. 
the new alliance strategizes and decide they need to take out Gibeon before that city can join forces with the Israelites. And then, after they take care of Gibeon, they're going to attack the Israelites. The Jews were camped about 20 miles away from Gibeon. So, these combined armies surround Gibeon and launch an attack. The Gibeonites, when they realize what's happening, they send word to Israel that they're under attack with a plea for the Hebrews to keep their oath. Here, once again, we see how the integrity of keeping promises is important to God and the kingdom of God. You know, the Israelites could have done nothing. By doing nothing, Gibeon would have been destroyed and the alliance they had been tricked into would have been nullified. But instead... Joshua called together his troops and he alerted them that they were going to march immediately. As they were quickly preparing, Joshua, who had learned a hard lesson, remember last chapter, when he didn't inquire of the Lord, he's not going to make that same mistake a second time. And what he does is open his heart to God in prayer. And God gives him an assurance. Verse 7. So Joshua marched out of Gilgal with his whole army, including his best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, Don't be afraid of those armies, because I will hand them over to you. None of them will be able to stand against you. Notice, Joshua is given a guarantee of victory. But he hasn't been given a detailed plan Now, the Israelites could have been like our man facing the coming flood. Joshua could have stopped with his prayer and because of the reassurance God had given him, just assumed that God would strike all the other guys in the other armies dead. He could have stayed in Gilgal. But Joshua understood something that I think is really important for us. Joshua understood that God is in covenant with his people. He does his part. We do our part. So Joshua musters his resources, which in this story is an army. And they don't just casually head off to Gibeon. To really understand the dedication of their allegiance to this little city-state that had tricked them into making a promise of safety with them, we need just a little geography lesson. They march through the night. They would have had to march up a very steep ravine to where Ai used to be. And then they would have to turn and go south to Gibeon. It would be a march of 20 miles between sundown and sunup. Now let's think about that. According to Google Maps, I went out and put in Fawcett, Missouri. Fawcett, Missouri is 19 miles away. And then I put in the little guy that you show him. He's got a walking stick and he's walking. And I put that in, and it says it would take six hours and 29 minutes to walk from the church to Fawcett. Uh, <laughs> and that's on a good highway by yourself. No difficulties. In this story, there are at least 40,000 soldiers with gear in the dark on very strenuous terrain. That tells us they hustle big time because they get there before daybreak. It would have meant effort. 
It would have meant discipline. It would have meant loyal commitment to a people that had snookered them into making a promise. The Israelites accomplished this unbelievable march and they surprised the armies of Adonai Zedek. Verse 9, Joshua and his army marched all night from Gilgal for a surprise attack. The Lord confused those armies when Israel attacked. So Israel defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. They chased them along the road going up to Beth Horon and killed men all the way to Azekah and Mekedah. And they chased the enemy down the Beth Horon Pass to Azekah. The Lord threw large hailstones on them from the sky and killed them. More people were killed by the hailstones than by the Israelites' swords. Without a plan, Without a step-by-step -step guide, Joshua and the army put out an all-out effort. They give it everything they've got. The Israelites go. They utilize all the opportunities, all the gifts, all the skill, all the training God has prepared them with. They use everything the Lord has provided to follow the original plan to possess the promised land. Remember, that's the plan. Possess the promised land. They are nothing like the man who had climbed to his roof and asked God to rescue him and then did not take advantage of what God provided. Why? Why didn't that man go? when God brought the warning through the news. Why didn't he climb in the boat? Could it be it was because he wasn't prepared? Could it be that he wasn't equipped? Could it be he wasn't even willing? It can be so easy to pray and do nothing. we can fall into that trap. It can be so easy to get apathetic, even when we're believers. It can be so easy to get so busy that we whisper this prayer and then hope for the best. Not Joshua. Not Joshua and the Hebrews. They have pushed themselves to do everything that God has placed in front of them. When the flood of the Canaanite army began its assault, they kept their promises to God and to others no matter what. They expended effort and made the most of everything God had equipped them with and for. They gave it all they had. And it is at that moment when God steps in. He sends down hail to defeat a great part of the enemy. Now at this point, at this point the hail starts falling and it must have been pretty good size hailstones because obviously it caved in people's heads. And Joshua could have just went, okay, Israelites, let's just step back and let God do the rest. But they didn't do that. They kept fighting, even when the hailstones were falling. How hard would that be? How hard would that be? You see, Joshua and that army understood they were in a covenant with God. The Lord would go before them. The Lord would save them. The Israelites were still to do their part in possessing the land. This meant they must be on their feet. It meant they must be serving. It meant they must be praying. It meant they must be doing whatever God has placed in front of them to do. 
when the boat pulled up for those guys, they would have been jumped on and hanging off. Well, now back to the story. The Canaanites are on the run. What's left of them anyway. And the Hebrews are now the aggressors. The hail has thinned out the enemy and Joshua stands where he can see you know, I can just picture him up on one of the hills because it's rolling hills in that area. And he realizes that the sun is going to set before they complete the task God has given them. Verse 12. On the day that the Lord gave up the Amorites to the Israelites, Joshua stood before all the people of Israel and said to the Lord, Sun, stand still over Gibeon. Moon, stand still over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the people defeated their enemies. These words are written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and waited to go down for a full day. That has never happened at any time before that day or since. That was the day the Lord listened to a human being. Truly, the Lord was fighting for Israel. Joshua realizes if the enemy is defeated right there, the way into the next part of the task, the way into the next part of the promised land will be open. And what does Joshua do? He prays the biggest prayer ever. I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of incredible prayers in the Bible. But I don't know. I mean, this guy doesn't start his prayer with praise the Lord, oh my soul. It's not a psalm. This guy's in the heat of battle. And he, I, he calls out to God. And he tells God, here's what needs to happen. Now, I don't always recommend that kind of prayer. <laughs> it tends to get me in trouble. But I think here's what we can learn from it. You see, Joshua wasn't just calling out a, a prayer on his behalf. He wasn't just telling the God what to do. Joshua already knew what the Lord wanted him to do. Joshua knew that the Lord wanted him to possess the land, to defeat that army. He was in the middle of doing that task and he needed some help. So he calls out to God. Sometimes I wonder if when we pray, and we pray really audacious prayers, if it's because we're in the middle of God's purpose and God's task and what God has called us to, or are we just trying to get what we think we need or what we think somebody else needs? I think there's a big difference there. So Joshua prays this incredible prayer. He asks for the impossible, and God does the impossible. He really does. God does the impossible here. That's because nothing is too great, nothing is too hard, and nothing is too incredible for our God. When we are on the path God has placed us on, and when we are in the will of the Father, and when we are doing the will of the Father, nothing's too great for the Lord. We serve and follow a mighty, mighty Savior. So God hears this prayer of his faithful follower and he answers it. Now we need to notice that the sun continued to shine or whatever happened in the sky. Joshua and the army could have sat down and went, well, the sun's going to shine longer than it should. We'll just let it bake the rest of the army to death. But they don't do that. They don't quit. They don't take a coffee break and they don't let somebody else finish what God's called them to do. They continue to fight. 
They continue to serve. They continue to follow the command of the Lord to go and possess the land. It is their focus. Consider all that's happened. This army marched all night for a people that had tricked them. They attack an army. They are all fighting with ancient weapons which take an incredible amount of strength and skill. I doubt seriously if a lunch whistle blew and let them take a break. They fought through a raging storm that dropped hail, huge hailstones. Now they have continued to chase, run, climb, and fight another entire day because the sun never set. Joshua and the army knew what God had called them to go, to do, and to be as his people. God had given them skill. God had given them, them a relentless stick-to-it attitude. And they use it. They don't give up. They don't quit. Apathy at this point in the life of Israel is not even in their vocabulary. For these folks, when the water submerged the roof and the helicopter arrived, they are on it. Scripture tells us, Ephesians 5.15, make the most of every opportunity. That's what we're called to. That's what we're called to. We are called to make the most of every opportunity. I don't care if you're at work. I don't care if you're at school. I don't care where you're at. I don't care what you're doing. We are called to make the most of every opportunity. What did Jesus command? What did Jesus command? Y'all know it because I say it all the time. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. A new command I give you that you love one another. And he ends with go into all the world and make disciples. Bam. That's, our, that's the land we're to possess. That's the land we're to possess. The rest of chapter 10 gives a play-by-play -play of how God, through Joshua, defeats this army of enemies. You all realize we're in a battle. You all realize that the enemy is extremely active. If you don't believe me, just watch one newscast. <laughs> if you don't believe me, sit around with some teenagers and ask them what their challenges are. If you don't believe me, go to work somewhere and listen to the conversation in a break room. If I need my hair curled, I could go there. But through all of that, through everything that's happened in the story, it ends with verse 42. He, Joshua, captured all the cities and their kings on one trip because the Lord, the God of Israel, was fighting for Israel. God is fighting for us in every way, even when we can't see it, even when we don't know it, even when we can't feel it. God is is moving so that his purposes will be accomplished. And we're part of that purpose. We don't just get to sit around and be apathetic and hope for the best. Wherever God has put every one of us, we need to be taking his kingdom and fighting for his kingdom. God was fighting for Israel. We've seen it. We've seen the walls of Jericho crumble. We've seen the river go dry. Now we've seen hailstones large enough to kill people when they're in the middle of a fight. And the sun stops in its tracks. Whatever that might mean. I don't even know. Because the Hebrew's really weird there. 
And if the sun stopped for a whole day, believe you me, the Hebrew would be really weird. <laughs> but Israel had to fight too. That's what we need to get out of this. Israel had to fight too. They had to keep fighting. Jesus has saved us. Hallelujah. Amen. He has given us new life. He has poured his spirit into us. He has given everyone in this room spiritual gifts, skills, and talents. He has told us to love God, love our neighbor, love each other. He's told us to go into the world. That is his truth. That is our possessing of the land. Our Lord and Savior has equipped us with everything we need for every battle. We are to possess the territory where God has called us. And like Israel, we need to be relentless. We are to press on to the prize, Philippians 3.14. We are to remain steadfast under trial, James 1.12. Let us not grow weary of doing good, Galatians 6.9. We will not fear though the earth gives way, Psalm 46.2. And, and, one of my favorites, we have troubles all around us, but we are not defeated. We do not know what to do, but we are never going to give up the living hope. We are persecuted, but God does not leave us. We are hurt sometimes, but we are not destroyed. We have a God who is fighting for us. He is fighting alongside of us. No matter what we are going through. We have a gracious God that equips, enables, and loves us beyond measure. We have a Lord who will never leave us or forsake us. I say, let's go fight. Whatever that may mean in your context. Let's go possess the territory that the devil has taken. Somebody said one time, you listen to rock music? I said, I sure do, because I'm taking back anything the devil's taken. Somebody one time said, would you use money that had been used in an ill way? You doggone right. I'll put it right in that offering plate and let the Lord do whatever he wants to with it. Brothers and sisters, let's take back what the enemy is squatting on. Yes. He's already defeated. Don't we get it? He's already defeated. He's just trying to mess with God's people. He is trying to capture as many as he can before he is put into the pit. We got to fight. We got to fight for our children. We got to fight for our families. We got to fight for our little city. We got to fight for our state. We got to fight for our nation. Whatever that may mean in your context, I don't know because each of us have a different call. You realize that not all these soldiers carried the same weapon. You realize that not all these soldiers fought the same way. But they all were combined together for one purpose, possess the promised land. Let's pull together. Let's be the army that's led by our Joshua. You know what another word for Joshua is, don't you? Anybody know? Jesus. It's Jesus. Did you know that? Yeah. It's Yeshua. We are being led by our Joshua, Jesus Christ. When he broadcasts, go, let's go. When he says, get in the boat, let's climb in. When he says, there's a helicopter, jump on. Let's be hanging off the sides. You see, Jesus has already won the victory. And he did it with his very body and his very blood. 
body and blood, man, it gives a whole new meaning to communion, doesn't it? This is not just a remembering of his sacrifice. This is a remembering of the victory that Jesus Christ has already wrought for every one of us who call him our Savior. Wow! No wonder, no wonder somehow it gives us strength for the journey. The Lord himself ordained this holy sacrament. He commanded his disciples to partake of the bread and wine. And, and remember when he did it? Remember when he did it? The darkest night. They, he knew what they were going to need. This is his table. The feast is for his disciples no matter what weapon you carry and no matter how you fight. Let all those who have with true repentance forsaken their sins and believed in Christ unto salvation draw near and take these emblems and by faith partake of the victory of Jesus Christ. Let all who are seeking to know more about Jesus come and receive with an open heart. Everyone in attendance is invited to participate. And may the Spirit of the Almighty God remind us to go and possess the land.